Hello, and welcome to New Scientist Weekly, home of the most fascinating science and technology news. I'm Timothy Revel in London. And I'm Christy Taylor in New York. This week on the pod, we are going to blow your mind. The news has been just that fascinating. We've got stories about how dark matter in the early universe may be why we have supermassive black holes today, and a particle that existed in negative time without breaking the laws of physics somehow. And the Earth may once have had its own ring of debris. And on top of all of that, there's a tiny, tiny newly discovered lizard that you are just absolutely going to love. But first, we've got a story about the surprising and more intricate than we thought link between loneliness and our health. It is fairly well established that loneliness can actually cause some conditions like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But new research seems to be painting a more nuanced picture. While loneliness does seem to lead to some health problems it may just be an indicator of many others. Senior News Editor Sophie Bushwick is here. Hi, Sophie. Hello. Thanks for joining us. So can you just give us some of the backstory here? Like loneliness has been linked to many health conditions before, right? Yes. There's been a lot of data connecting loneliness to certain cancers, digestive issues, and even early death. And researchers have looked for the mechanisms trying to figure out how loneliness worsens health. They've found connections like increased inflammation, excessive stress responses, and other traits that could increase your risk of any of those issues. Okay. that I mean, that all sounds very plausible. But I guess there's this new research now that's suggesting it may not be true, at least in the way that we thought. What's this new paper saying? Right. It is more complicated, according to a new paper from researchers in China. They took the big data statistical approach. So they looked at several major biomedical databases that included information for more than 75,000 people in the UK, China, and the US. And first of all, this statistical approach did find a connection between loneliness and as many as 30 health conditions, including cancers. But the next step was to look at people's genetics, and that's where it got interesting. Sophie, I guess I'm just trying to picture what exactly our genes can say about loneliness. Like, am I doomed and I just don't know? Like, is there a loneliness gene? Well, your genes won't tell you if you're currently lonely, but what the team looked at was there are genes that are associated with your likelihood of experiencing loneliness, and that's been pretty well documented. So they look at these genes, and they looked at whether they could find a causal link in the patient data between the loneliness genes and these conditions, these health conditions. In most cases, they couldn't find a connection. Hmm. So something like type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease only seems to occur alongside loneliness. And it's possible maybe we should look at loneliness as more of an indicator of whether disease is going to be present in these cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know this is just one study, but is this like the end then of loneliness as a cause of any health conditions? Or were there some places where maybe there's still a link? No, no, that's the interesting thing. There were six conditions where the researchers saw what they say could be a causal relationship. And these were depression, hyperthyroidism, Mm. asthma, sleep apnea, substance abuse, and hearing loss. And the team does plan to do more work looking at what the biological mechanisms would be for the six conditions. They want to look at stress hormones and inflammation and that kind of thing. It does feel like some of those are a bit easier to understand. Depression and loneliness feel very close to each other, at least in my mind. But asthma or hearing loss and loneliness, they kind of seem a bit further away. For these conditions where loneliness now seems to be a bit less causal, Does that affect the potential treatments or interventions we might have in the future? It could. If you're setting out to reduce how many people have cardiovascular problems and you're starting with treating loneliness, it's helpful to know in advance that it's maybe not going to work based on this research. And we already do have some public health interventions that take that loneliness first approach to improving health. So one researcher not connected to this study has said these results suggest it's time to reevaluate those programs or at least that we we need to try to understand better whether having these good social connections and alleviating loneliness actually does improve people's health before we put more resources into loneliness relief programs. Got it. So instead of like looking for links between loneliness and bad health, maybe we need to put a bit more work into the opposite, like finding links between more social connections and better health. 
Exactly. Next up, supermassive black holes. These are the really, really big ones with masses that range from 100,000 to several billion times the mass of our sun. But one of the many mysteries of their existence is how exactly they could have formed in the early universe. Leah Crane is here to explain new work on how another cosmic mystery, dark matter, could help us solve this one. Hey, Leah. Hello. All right. So why is the existence of supermassive black holes such a huge mystery? What makes it weird besides, you know, the astounding fact of their very existence? (laughs) Essentially, we don't know how they could possibly form. We see these extraordinarily huge black holes, millions and billions of times the mass of the sun. We see them really early in the universe's history. And there just wasn't enough time for them to grow so big through any normal mechanism. So they have to have formed in some weird way. One of the ways that's been proposed is through collapse of a really huge cloud of gas straight into a black hole, which is called direct collapse, fittingly. And that's the way that this new study looked into. Got it. So where does dark matter come in? How would this solve the problem? (laughs) So the problem with direct collapse in particular is that when you have a big cloud, parts of it are going to cool off and sort of break away from the rest of the cloud. So they'll collapse and form smaller objects, and then the rest of the cloud won't have enough mass to form a supermassive black hole. Mm -hmm. But what dark matter can do is it can decay into radiation, and that radiation can smash into the hydrogen molecules in the cloud that make parts of it cool off. Mm -hmm. And that keeps the whole cloud hot so that it can go through direct collapse instead of breaking up into lots of smaller fragments. And all this comes from a team at UCLA that have run some simulations of this process and concluded that it's a really plausible option to make direct collapse work. So I know from other talks we've had with you, Leah, that there's more than one actual thing that dark matter could be. So how many of these possible dark matter candidates might actually work with this theorized process of black hole formation? So the dark matter candidates exist on sort of a spectrum. So it's not really a question of how many. It's more of a range of properties that they could have. So in this case, the dark matter particles would have to have a particular mass for it to work. And that mass is pretty light. And the most well-known dark matter candidate in that mass range is the axion. But there are a bunch of other similar ones, too. Where does this leave the maybe most popular or at least famous to me candidate, the uh, elusive WIMP? Uh, I'd say WIMPs are definitely the most popular, but (laughs) this mechanism wouldn't work with WIMPs because they're Mm -hmm. too heavy to emit the right kind of radiation to keep that cloud sort of uniformly warm. Mm -hmm. So if dark matter is WIMPs, it's less likely that supermassive black holes could form from direct collapse. But we really have no idea if it's WIMPs or not, so that's sort of a bridge we'll have to cross when we come to it. So many contingencies. You did also say that direct collapse is only one theory of how supermassive black holes might have formed. Is it even the most, you know, speaking popularity, is it even the most popular? You know, how does all of this theorizing stack up against other theories of how we could have gotten these supermassive black holes? I'd say direct collapse is probably not the most popular. I think for many researchers, the most popular idea is that supermassive black holes formed from these giant stars called population three stars. But direct collapse would actually form much bigger black holes than population three stars. And we're seeing really big black holes with the James Webb Space Telescope. So direct collapse is getting more intriguing Mm -hmm. as a possibility. But as more data comes in from JWST, we should be able to get a better idea of what's really going on. And at least now we know that direct collapse is plausible. We just want to take a quick break to remind you, everything you hear from us week after week comes straight from the brilliant minds and keen reporting noses of the New Scientist journalists. And there's so much that we can't cover, which is why we've got a special offer on digital subscriptions starting this week. You will get 10 weeks of unlimited digital access to NewScientist.com and our app. And that's just for £10 or US dollars. Visit NewScientist.com slash podcast to learn more. That's NewScientist.com slash podcast. Next up, we've got the story of one plucky little photon. It's a photon that hung out with some atoms for an amount of time that physicists recorded as negative. Yeah, negative time. That's what we've got this week. If that sounds a little awkward and confusing to you and a little bit like time travel, 
Luckily, we've got physics reporter Carmela Padovic Callahan here to explain it all and reassure us that the laws of physics are still, in fact, intact. Hi, Carmela. Hello. What was this experiment where this weird negative time thing happened? Can you explain it to us? Right. So it was uh, an experiment with particles of light, which you call photons, and a cloud of atoms. And the atoms were almost as cold as absolute zero, so ultra cold. The photons were sent through the atoms, and the researchers were measuring when the photons reemerged. But because there's an interaction between the photons and these ultra cold atoms, some of the photons were observed leaving the cloud before they'd even entered. So through this interaction, somehow we end up with negative time. Okay, so I'm, j- I'm just trying to wrap my head around this in, in terms that I understand. And it, uh, is it kind of like the quantum version of researchers looking at one of those airport scanners waiting for someone to walk through, and then they actually saw them leave the scanner and then walk through it, you know, in the, in the wrong order? Is, is that what's going on here? I mean, that's not a bad mental image, but unfortunately, you have to remember that we're in the quantum realm. So measuring things without destroying them is really difficult. Mm. Like, you know, when you put a photon through a scanner, you, you're kind of uh, taking information away from it. So what the researchers did here was a lot more indirect. They, they use something that's called a weak measurement, which is which is like a lot less intense than you just like keeping your eyeballs on the scanner. You know, they were like keeping track of everyone else who was going through the scanner and like trying to like find other indications of of what may have happened. So looking at the scanner, looking at other people going through the scanner and then kind of collecting all that information and like inferring whether negative time could have been at play here. Okay. I guess I I just have one question, which is... um... What? Like, what, what, what is going on here? <laughs> Quantum. Yeah, I mean, really, Yeah, as Christy was just saying, like, this is sort of where, like, it really helps to remember that we're working with quantum effects, which, mm. which give us more sort of knobs to change things than what you get in the world that we intuitively experience. So like a person going to a scanner is never going to live the life of a single photon. But the crux here is that, you know, you're doing this experiment with these atoms, which are under extreme conditions, and they can be controlled very well through quantum effects because they're so cold. So when you put light to a material, it slows down because atoms in that material are briefly absorbing it. Like a photon will sort of go into an atom, get absorbed, it will become an excitation of that atom, like it'll be stuck in the atom for a little bit, and then the atom will re-emit it, and then it will exit the material. So, so you know, it spent some time being like not a photon, but rather an atomic excitation, and this causes a delay. But if you have an ultra cold atom, one of these atoms that you can really control well, like you can tune its energy by shining lasers on it, or you can you know, keep it in place by putting a magnetic field on it, then you can sort of cook up a situation where weird things happen. So the researchers that I talked to, they just tried out a bunch of these scenarios of sort of what state does the atom have to be in, what frequencies does the photon has to have to, to see different arrays of times where the photon is stuck in the atom. And they just came across one where all the measurements indicated that the time that the photon spent being an atomic excitation was negative. Okay, I get that so much is possible with quantum, but, and I say it like it's in capital Q, (laughs) but how doesn't this break any laws of physics? Yeah, I mean, this is the super interesting part is, you know, we always say that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. And that is true, but there's a sort of uh, a caveat that we don't always say out loud, which is that you can't move information faster than the speed of light. Like you would break the laws of causality if you could transmit information faster than the speed of light. And in this particular case, you know, they are looking at an experiment and, and like getting out these incredible numbers, but the photon is like not telling anything to anyone. The photon's not like traveling back in time to deliver a message. It just seems like some photons are doing this if you tune the experiment correctly. 
And actually, it would be really hard to to turn this into like a practical message delivery device or such, because as we've talked about before, like these measurements, you have to do them extremely carefully to not destroy everything that's <laughs> happening in the experiment. So, you know, to get one data point for one photon that's doing this negative time th- trick, you need to collect data for like 15 hours at a time. So... So this is like very fundamental, quirky stuff, but but it's not like you are, you know, time traveling and breaking the laws of physics. Ah, that's a little bit disappointing. I thought all of this time going into one photon would certainly get a time machine out at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the bright side, you know, it's always great to have another insight into how much there can happen in the quantum world. Like the richness of the quantum world like continues to amaze and, and it's worth exploring. But on the more sort of practical side, we are doing so many practical things at Quantum Light these days. Like Quantum Light is a huge contender for extra secure communication channels. So, you know, like understanding even the most extreme outlier behaviors like could eventually come in handy as we evaluate how we, you know, build an unhackable quantum internet or whatever have you. Like it, it could it could happen. All right, Tim, it is time. Every week we learn amazing blow your mind facts from our reporters and somehow have to leave a solid like two thirds of them on the cutting room floor. And I refuse to let today's podcast end without telling you one of my favorites. It looks like the Earth may have once had a ring around it. Well, Beyonce would be pleased. Um, (laughs) Are we talking like a Saturn level ring here or something a little inferior to that? Well, you know, nothing can quite compare to Saturn's, you know, really beautiful, wide, colorful displays of rings. So, yeah. So, no, not quite. This instead would have been the remains of a single asteroid, and it would have been here around 460 million years ago. And we know this, or we think this, because the Earth experienced an unusually large number of meteorite impacts around that time, which made researchers go looking for a possible cause. And what they figured out, kind of based on like the way continents have drifted in the time since, is that these impact sites would all have been very close to the equator, which very much suggests that there was this ring of debris circling our equator. And the odds of that pattern being random are something like one in 25 million. Okay, well, unlikely. And, you know, I buy that logic. Where did Mm -hmm. we get the ring? Well, you know, when a planet loves another planet very much... (laughs) uh, (laughs) So, no, what what probably would have happened is that we kind of tore apart an asteroid that got too close to us, uh, kind of the usual. But another cool thing about this having a ring thing is that even if it was for a very short period of time, having this sort of circle of debris around our equator could have also potentially affected our climate. But, yeah, there's still kind of a lot that we would have to figure out in order to really understand that aspect um, or even kind of verify that this is something that happened. Still amazing. I I love that idea that Mm -hmm. Earth could have once Mm -hmm. had a ring around it. There's still so much we don't understand about the Earth's history. All right. How would you like to hear about the biggest object in the known universe? I mean, yes, obviously. Well, I'm glad you said that as I didn't have something prepared for if you said no. (laughs) Anyway, what we're talking about here is jets from black holes. Now, these are streams of radio waves and particles that move close to the speed of light. And we sometimes see them coming from black holes. These jets are basically matter the black hole attracted with its massive gravitational forces, but then very fantastically pushed back away with its also massive magnetic field. And a team has now found, well, the largest ever pair of these jets. All right. All right. I'm interested. Hit me with some numbers. How big are they? 140 times the length of the Milky Way, which is 23 million light years across. I mean, amazing. And the researchers have calculated that in order to get that big, the black hole responsible for these jets had to have been ingesting a sun's worth of matter every year for more than a billion years. Tim, that is absolutely incredible. I mean, mind-blowing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I can't even picture, like, the scale of what we're talking about. Yeah, uh, eating a sun's worth of matter every year for a billion years. Like, for a billion years. Even doing yeah. that once seems like a lot. This is also, this finding has been quite confusing for astrophysicists because it's not really clear how jets this big could have lasted for a whole billion years. As at that point in the universe's history, it's much more likely that something might have interrupted them somehow. And we also can't really model jets this big because the scale is just so huge. 
They may also be so huge that they could have influenced the formation of other galaxies and even injected magnetic fields and energy into other regions, so had loads of impacts in the universe. Wow, that is maybe the coolest thing I've heard this week. And that said, I do have to bring us one more story, very close to home, also very cool. I want to talk about how some flowers seem to have evolved longer stems in order to help bats find them with their echolocation. Okay, very neat. Tell me more. So researchers already know that many plants that rely on bat pollination already kind of share some bat-friendly traits. Their flowers open at night when bats are out, and they have mustier smells as opposed to sweeter ones. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Bats famously, they love a musty smell. I mean, that's the first thing I ever learned about bats. (laughs) So researchers have also noticed that these bat-friendly flowers often have longer stems than non-bat-specific flowers. The flowers will hang down from branches or extend out from trunks of trees. And researchers at the University of Missouri wanted to know if this trait, like the others, made it easier for bats to find them. Yeah, I mean, that that makes sense. A flower just hanging out in empty space is going to be a lot easier to hear your clicks bounce back from than a flower hanging out in some leaves or right next to a branch, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Guess kind of like hearing a violin solo in an orchestra, it's better if the violinist stands away from the rest of the musicians for you to pick them out. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing they didn't just think about this uh, on a podcast. I'm guessing they actually have some (laughs) data to back it up. Right. They do now. Uh, The research team basically set up a bunch of different experiments with this bat called the tailed tailless bat. That is its real name. And (laughs) single blooms of the bellflower plant. And they placed the flower on different lengths of wire to give it different, you know, sort of fake stem lengths. And then they also varied whether it was alone in the enclosure or surrounded by lots of foliage, which would be, you know, kind of acoustic noise around it. And when the flower was alone, when there was no other stuff in the area to confuse it with, it didn't seem to really matter how long the stem was. The bats found it equally quickly. But when the flower was surrounded by foliage, which is, you know, the equivalent of a very acoustically cluttered environment, the bats found the long-stemmed flowers twice as fast as the shorter-stemmed ones. So it really seems like this trait may be kind of the sound equivalent of evolving to be a bright color, for example, for pollinators like bees that rely on vision. One more little thing before we go. In fact, this is an adorably tiny thing. It's a brand new species of chameleon that was discovered by tourists in Madagascar. And then researchers learned about it from social media posts. Now, this chameleon, it's just 33 millimeters long. That's less than the size of a thumbnail. Yeah, we've got a picture up on our website. It is a thumbnail that is literally the size of a thumbnail. (laughs) This is also my last day in the podcast Minds for New Scientist. It has been such fun, and I'm on to new things now. It's been absolutely fantastic having you on the podcast, Christy, and personally, so much fun hosting with you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, but everyone's fascination is in good hands now. Rowan Hooper and company will be back next week. And that's it for this show. If you like the New Scientist podcast and think more people should know about us, please do give us a five-star rating or even a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. As usual, we've got more fascinating stories from New Scientist on our website at newscientist.com, which only opens at night, has a musty smell, and has evolved longer stems in order to attract the attention of echolocating science lovers. (laughs) We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.